Frankenstein's The Naked Truth About Women, Body Image, and Reimaging the Perfect Body, a frequent contributor to O, The Oprah Magazine, Self, Women's Health, and more. She also blogs at healthbreaksloose.com, The Huffington Post, and TheBump.com, and is a body image consultant for Dove. Uh, Leslie is currently working on her third and fourth books, A Guide to Empowering Young Girls and a Memoir of Infertility. She lives in Chicago with her husband and her eight-month-old daughter, Evie. Um, and thanks to student engagement and to Delta Phi Epsilon, here's Leslie Goldman. Hi, this worked out so, so well because, um, you know, I met Rachel and Marilyn um, in, uh, and, uh, and um, Michelle Heyer. I know your name, Michelle Heyer. <laughs> um, because, because just now I asked you, I said, does she pronounce her last name here? And I was being very fancy. I thought your French maybe was Michelle Heyer. So you should start, doing, start saying it that way. <laughs> um, we met in Miami. And then when they came up to me afterwards and said, we'd love for you to come to our school, I found out that the school is just 10 minutes away from my in-law's house. So we made a family road trip. And we all came up here on Saturday and have been here ever since. And my favorite bakery, I think, is right around the corner, Dakota Bread. Is that just right by where we are, I think, on Orchard Lake Road? So I always go there and get bread. Um, so yes, I know this area well. And I'm excited to talk to you all. So it's going to be a talk about body image and why women feel the way that we do about our bodies and the things that we say to ourselves um, in our minds and out loud. And also, you know, there are things, I think, for men to pick up on so they can help support us when we go through these kinds of trials and tribulations, and also because men have their own body image issues as well, which we actually talked a little bit about at dinner. So to start, I want to show you a quick video. Some of you might have seen this. It's a Dove video, um, and we'll use this to kick off the talk. <laughs> Um, okay, you can flip. thanks. So when I gave this talk in Miami, it was the first time I'd seen that video, which I had shown literally 50, 60 times before. It was the first time I'd seen it after having my daughter, and I totally broke down and just lost everything in front of the entire audience because to imagine my daughter hating herself or thinking those things about her or feeling like she had to cut parts of her body off or open um, or that she had to make herself throw up after eating because she felt fat. It was, it's just almost too much to bear. And it made me really realize what I put my parents through when I had my eating disorder in college. I didn't do it on purpose, of course, but I'm sure it was just terrible for them. Um, but I, I think I made up for it with a couple things, including that little baby who they love <laughs> seeing so much. Um, so, you know, the, the tagline of that video is talk to your daughter before the beauty industry does. And I think that that rapid fire succession of images really sums up how many of us feel living in the society. I mean, everywhere we look, we see images of how women are supposed to look. Um, that we're supposed to be skinny, we're supposed to have, you know, no hips and a big chest, we're supposed to eat a certain way and exercise a certain way and feel badly if we eat a piece of cake and feel virtuous if we get on the scale and the number is, you know, quote unquote, good for that day. And, you know, I wish that someone had talked to me before the beauty industry did. Um, when I got to college, I went to UW-Madison, and when I got there, I, it seemed like I had everything going for me. I, mean, I was a straight-A student, I had tons of friends, I was involved in lots of extracurricular activities at my high school, and 
um, I was you know, really outgoing. And what my parents and I didn't know was that I, so many of those characteristics that I just listed kind of read like a laundry list of things that can predispose you to an eating disorder. Um, a lot of times, girls and women that go through these, these sorts of body image issues have so much going on and it seems like every, they have this kind of veneer of everything being perfect from the outside, but on the inside, you know, that's, when you get to college, and you find yourself thinking things like, am I going to be you know, good enough? Am I going to be able to make friends here? Am I going to um, be as successful as I was when I was younger? It's this time of transition and that's when eating disorders tend to surface because they are a way to feel like you're in control of something. And so you know, I got to college and uh, I remember being at my first fraternity party. I didn't rush, I was a DG. I didn't rush until my sophomore year, but I remember being at my first fraternity party and I was sitting on the stairs um, drinking a Coca-Cola because <laughs> I was only 17. <laughs> and, um, okay, I wasn't drinking Coke. And I remember seeing, you know, the boys weren't talking to me, but I remember that there were a group of guys that were talking to this group of girls there and they were wearing these kind of tight black pants, and these little strappy tank tops and they had makeup on and I was wearing jeans and uh, like, like a ripped purple t-shirt from the Gap. And I was used to guys paying attention to me in high school, but here I wasn't really getting that. And I remember noticing that these girls were all pretty thin. And I didn't have any sort of weight issue. Um, but I remember thinking, and I was really fit, I worked out, but I was healthy. And, and I remember thinking, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just try and lose a, a few pounds. And I thought tomorrow, instead of going jogging for half an hour, which I would normally do, maybe I'll go jogging for 45 minutes. And so I just kind of kicked up my workout routine a little bit. And I, I remember for some reason, this image of Cindy Crawford popped in my mind. I remember I had read that Cindy Crawford, who was my height, weighed 128 pounds. So that number, which I'm sure is not real because there are Great Danes that weigh more than 128 pounds. I mean, that is not a lot at all for someone my height to weigh. But I remember that kind of becoming this sort of goal in my mind. So the next day I started, you know, working out a little bit more and eating just a little bit less. I was a nutritional sciences major, so I felt like I could, you know, kind of beat the system and I maybe instead of a big bowl of cereal and a bagel and fruit for breakfast, I just had, you know, some cereal and some fruit. Just a little bit. And, you know, those changes were enough to make a difference and I lost maybe five pounds and I started getting compliments from people. You know, people would say, oh, you look good. Did you lose some weight? Because those, those two sentences always come together. No one ever says, you're losing weight. Is everything okay? It's always, you look good. Did you lose weight? And I've done it too. I'm guilty of saying that to people too. And, uh, and so that kind of fueled the fire. And so then I started working out a little bit more and eating a little bit less. And the whole thing happened so quickly. I mean, to think back about how quickly it happened, it's, it's just kind of mind boggling. And if you've ever seen a friend going through an eating disorder, you know how quickly the descent can take place. I mean, it's, it's just spirals out of control extre extremely fast. And, um, and so, you know, every morning I would wake up and go down to my gym, um, to my, my dorm had a gym, and I'd go down to the gym every morning and weigh myself on the scale. And I remember one morning, maybe two months later, pushing the little, you know, bar over on the scale and it read 128. And so, you know, Cindy Crawford territory. And I had been doing, you know, my mom had been sending me care packages with Swedish fish and Rice Krispie treats. And I would just kind of give them to the people on my other friends on my floor, including my husband who, um, you know, would gladly accept all the little treats. And, and I remember seeing 128, but I did not look like Cindy Crawford. I, uh, I had just, dark circles under my eyes. I still have them, but the baby is responsible. Um, you know, I remember I watched being down by my elbow. I had no chest. The baby is responsible for these two. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, I'd stopped getting my period, but even, even though I got into that number, I remember looking in the mirror and kind of bending over and grabbing my stomach and saying, why is there still this fat here? It, it's like I couldn't see what other people could see. And so when you have an eating disorder, you know, when people who have body image issues, it doesn't have to be an actual eating disorder, it could be disordered eating or just body image issues. When they complain that they feel fat and they clearly are not overweight, it, they're not looking for attention or for a compliment. It's, you know, anorexia and bulimia are, are actual psychiatric diseases and they change, they, there's something going on in your brain where you can't properly interpret how you look. And so I, you know, I did think that I looked 
bat at that time still. And I remember going home for Thanksgiving. It was the first time my parents had seen me in a few months and obviously everyone was pretty shell-shocked. Um, I sat at the table for Thanksgiving and basically ruined the holiday for my family. I mean, this is a holiday that's all about celebrating what you have and you eat and you get stuff and you have to unbutton your pants. And I wouldn't eat the turkey because I had become a vegetarian. I wouldn't eat the stuffing because it had butter in it. I wouldn't eat the salad because it had salad dressing on it. Um, no one really knew what to do with me. They were all very scared. I went back to school, finished the semester, and when I came home, my parents basically said, we're going to get you help. We're going into a treatment facility. There was a hospital nearby. They dragged me there, and I remember one of the things that I hated so much about going to get help at this facility was they totally knew who I was before I got there. I mean, I had become this cliché. And I was someone who always prided myself on standing out, and yet I was just the eating disorder girl cliche. I mean, they knew all about, they knew that, um, you know, I wouldn't eat anything with fat in it. They knew that I, would, the only things, the only drinks that I would drink that had calories in it would be, uh, were, was alcohol, you know, like Long Islands. They knew that, um, you know, I would only chew sugar-free gum, that I had to work out every single day and, you know, keep track of my calories during the day. I just had fallen into this pattern that is just so, well known, and that was one. That was a very hard thing for me to deal with. Um, I wasn't doing well. I remember my, my pulse was something around. I think it was like 36, which is super low if you know anything about pulses, um, because my body was trying to conserve energy. And you know, even at my lowest point, I still wasn't you know 90 pounds. I mean, I think. I, some people say you shouldn't say numbers or not, but I, I, I think it's okay. I mean, I think my lowest was somewhere around 120. 5'11 and 120, that's what you hear that models weigh. But I'm telling you, I looked horrible. I mean, no one would look at me and think that I was a model. Anyone that would look at me would think that girl has something going on. And I'll show you some images before. I mean, I've been on the Today Show to talk about models being fired by Ralph Lauren for it being those exact measurements, maybe a tiny, like 5'11 and 115, being fired for being too fat. And I mean, when you get down to that point, you are, you know, your, your hips are, your, you're so small. There is, it just, it does not look good. So they wanted me to be, they wanted to admit me to this hospital and have me stay there and miss, you know, leave college. And I was not going to miss the next semester. I mean, I was college. I wanted to go back. So we struck this deal where I could go back, but I had to get weighed in once a week and the number had to either maintain or go up and I had to go see a therapist. So this was before therapy, before I realized, I mean, now all of my friends, we have therapists on speed dial and there's not a stigma about it. It's great. It's a nice hour that you can just go and just dump everything out and just leave there feeling refreshed. But back then, you know, I didn't want to see a therapist. I thought they can't help me because until you're ready to be helped, no one can make you get help. It's the same thing with, with so many other issues like alcoholism or drug abuse, or cutting, or um, you know any, any kind of problem like that where until the person is ready, you really can't force them to get help. And if you've ever gone through, you know, having a friend going through this, you know it's very hard. You can try calling your roommate's parents and telling them what's going on. You can try bringing them to the, um, the school health services to get them help, but until they're, they've kind of hit their, their bottom point, it's very hard. And so, I went back to school and you know at first I would have little tricks here and there to, for my weigh-ins like I would drink a lot of water before I went to get weighed in um, and I wasn't really taking the steps that were necessary to actually get well. I was just trying to put on a front. I'd go to the therapist and kind of cross my arms and say, how are you going to fix me because I wasn't really ready. And, you know, I did, you know, kind of get my weight back up a little bit. I'd eat some more low-fat granola bars and skim milk. I tried to still be healthy, even though now I realize I wasn't being healthy. And, um, and you know, I, I rushed my sophomore year, and I had a phenomenal experience in the Greek system. I loved being in, the, being in that house. But I definitely, there were kind of, you know, two groups of girls in my, in my house. So th we had 55 women living in at once, and uh, a lot of them were, you know, of the mindset of I don't telling our our, um, our house cook, you know, we don't want oil in the vegetables, we don't want butter in the pasta, and the other half were saying, we want cheese in our pasta, we want we don't want this fat-free, gross stuff that doesn't melt even if you microwave it for two minutes, and we want butter on our pasta, and and you know there were a good number of eating disorders in our, in our house. Um, 
my junior year, I was nominated for Outstanding Greek Woman on campus, and it came down to me and two other women. And so I didn't win, but I should have. And um, I, I'm not bitter. <laughs> and, um, and I remember they gave me a cake to bring back to my house, a uh, chocolate cake. And I brought it back, and I was eating it in my room with my two roommates, Diane and Eden, and I had a, a piece of cake. You know, I kind of forgot about the whole, you shouldn't eat it. And I ate it, and then I immediately regretted it. And so I thought I was being really sly, that they had no idea what I was doing. And I went down, I walked, I excused myself, just went to the bathroom, and I got rid of it. And little did I know that my friends had kind of tiptoed behind me to listen at the door because they knew what was happening. And it's not easy to admit that in front of a room full of strangers, and I've admitted that in, full of, of, in front of a room full of 2,000 strangers. But the thing is, so many women in this room, and maybe some of the men, but so many of us have done that. I, I guarantee you that there are many people in this room who have made themselves throw up after eating, and it's sad and horrible, but it's just true. I mean, even Katie Couric and Lady Gaga, both in the last couple of weeks, have come out and talked about, oh, and um, Nicole Scherzinger from the Pussycat Dolls, all just came out and, and, and talked about how they were bulimic for, um, during their college years and beyond. I mean, the lead singer of the Pussycat Dolls, I remember seeing her on TV for the, some stupid reality show she was on and thinking, oh my gosh, she's so sexy. She's got such a great body. And little did I know that she was just sitting there making herself get rid of the food that she was eating because she felt so unsure of who she was. And so back to the sorority house, my girlfriends, I went back to the bathroom. I, I went back to the room. My girlfriends confronted me. I was horribly embarrassed and ashamed and I was you know, crying and it was very dramatic and very PBS after school special-esque. And, um, you know, sorority, bulimia. And so that was one of the times that I, that was, that was one of the moments that I had, kind of a, a bottom moment, you know, where I realized, okay, things aren't going really well. Maybe it's time to talk to someone about help. So I went back to that therapist who I remember had talked to me about trying medication. This was back when there was some good research just starting to come out showing that certain medications, certain types of antidepressants could help with, um, with eating disorders. And I had thought there was a stigma. I didn't want to be on a, a medicine like that. And like I said, little did I know that now so many of my friends would be on things like that. Um, and so I tried it. And I remember she said it might take a few weeks for it to work. And sure enough, a few weeks later, I remember looking in the mirror one morning. And it wasn't like I all of a sudden felt happy or skinny or perfect. It just felt like I was looking in the mirror and seeing what other people saw, like instead of looking in a wavy funhouse mirror and seeing a distorted image. I just felt like I was on a, an even playing field with everyone else. And now I realize that it just kind of works the same way as um, insulin for a diabetic or maybe someone who has a thyroid disorder and needs a little extra hormone, which I also have to take that too. Maybe there's just something in the brain that you just need a little extra boost in order to, to, to function in a healthy way like that. And I'm not saying medicine is always the answer, but for me, that definitely helps me to get better. So my senior year, I lived in a sorority house with, oh, Eula, is that what you were talking about? Okay. I might need your, oh, okay, good. Um, my senior year, I lived in a house down the street from my sorority house with six girls. And so there were seven of us. Six of the seven of us had some sort of eating disorder. It was either anorexia or bulimia or compulsive overexercising. Uh, so it was, it was a dysfunctional house. We had a lot of fun, but our, our kitchen was a total chaotic mess. And, um, and I remember I was taking a class, so I was a nutritional sciences major. I remember taking a class called World Hunger and Malnutrition. And one day when I was getting ready to graduate, so it was towards the end of my senior year, and I had just made this decision that I was no longer going to become a doctor. I was not going to go to medical school. I was withdrawing my, my medical school applications because I wanted to become a writer. I had taken a journalism class that had gone really well, and the teacher had helped me realize that this was actually my passion. So I made a big change. Remember when I talked about transitions going from high school to college, this was a big transition going from college to the real world. And I remember one day I couldn't go to class because I kept trying on outfit after outfit and everything I put on, I felt like, I felt as if I looked so horrible that I could not be seen outside of class. And this is a class where I was, we're literally learning about children who were starving of very, and suffering from various 
malnourishing diseases because they didn't have access to food. And here I was, a, you know, a happy or a, you know, a seemingly healthy woman with access to lots, to so many resources. And I was restricting what I was eating because I felt too fat. And so, you know, I ditched class that week. And I remember going into my professor who was a very buttoned up three piece suit kind of man. And probably not used to girls bawling at his desk about their eating disorders and I was crying and I remember him giving me Kleenexes and I got an A in the class still <laughs> but um but that was another moment where I realized okay things you need to start really addressing this and so that's kind of when I did start taking the steps to really start talking to a therapist about why was this happening because the why is really crucial so you know you hear that thing you hear sexual assault you know rape is not about sex and and Alcohol is not about alcohol. Um, just like that, eating disorders are not about food and they're not about calories. They're about going through some sort of issue in your life where it's so hard to actually work on that issue and so scary and daunting that you pick another way. You know, it's much easier to worry about how many calories you just burned on the step, step master, stairmaster or how many fat grams you ate you know, in t in, during the day than it is to think about Am I doing what I want to be doing in life? Am I going to be successful? Am I going to find a partner to share it with? Am I going to be happy? It's like a security blanket. It's like a coping mechanism. With with self injury and cutting, it's not about the actual cutting. It's about you know feeling so numb or so much pain in a certain area of life that you would actually prefer to feel the pain of, of hurting yourself than you would to feel those actual other real emotions. And so. Until you can actually grasp that and realize that, you can't really, I don't think, get that much, get, get better. So a lot of people will ask me, I have a roommate who has an eating disorder, how do I make her get better? And you, you can't make her, I, I feel horrible saying that. I'm not a social worker, so you might get a different answer from a psychologist, but I feel like you, the person has to really be willing to go and get help on their own. And so in my early 20s, I was, and there were definitely times throughout my early 20s where I was going through different issues in my life and I would find myself kind of dancing back words a little bit and reverting and and if you are someone who struggles with body image or with any of those other issues I talked about if you pay attention to the times they flare up you'll probably find that there are times of stress in your life maybe you're anxious over finals or graduating and finding a job maybe you just broke up with someone um, maybe someone in your family is sick and it could be anything but it's a lot easier to kind of fall back into those old patterns than it is to confront the new the new issues in your life that are even scarier. So I became a writer and I'm so glad that I did that. And, uh, you know, I was hearing like Sarah is a physics um, major, one of the girls that I went out, one of the women I went out with tonight. And I was thinking, oh, I took a physics class. I can't even fathom doing that every day, all day long. But um, so I made the right choice. I became a writer. And one of the first things I, I did was I wound up writing this book, um, Locker Room Diaries. And so this book is all about life in the women's locker room. And it's not as sexy or titillating as it might sound. Um, I basically, you know, I'm someone, I work out a lot and I would be in my locker room because I get super sweaty when I work out, like Michael Jordan sweaty. And I have to shower, I can't get in the car and drive home. And so I would be in my locker room and I would overhear women talking about their bodies and the things that they would say and the way they would treat themselves, it was so sad to hear and I was guilty of doing it too. And just seeing women look, in the, look at themselves in the mirror and and say, oh, you know, or, you know, grimacing when they look at parts of their body. And we have um, this big carnival-esque scale in our bath, in, in the locker room. It's huge. And you have to step on onto this register. And I would see women waiting in line to get on the scale. Or we actually have another scale, more of a medical scale in our locker room. And I would hear women say to each other, which scale is better today? Because one scale might tell you you weigh 145, but the other one says you weigh 147, and you for sure want to get on the 145 one, even though you weigh the same on both of them, actually. And so I started listening, and it's, it's not considered eavesdropping if you're doing it for journalistic purposes. So I would listen and, you know, have my little notepad and start writing things down, and pretty much, pretty soon, I just kind of began amassing all these different anecdotes, and, and that's what the book is about. And so each chapter is a different aspect of, 
aspect of life in the locker room. There's a chapter on boobs. There's a chapter on um, modesty. You know, why do some women feel okay walking around totally naked with their towel in their hand like it's their purse and other women scurry off to the stall and change in the, you know, without anyone seeing them. Um, there's a chapter on race and ethnicity and how is the locker room experience and just being naked in general and appreciating your body different for women um, from different backgrounds. Uh, there's a chapter on um, beauty rituals and the crazy bizarre things that women do like applying wax to our skin and ripping the hair out by the root and things like that. And a chapter on um, you know being overweight and how today it's kind of still okay to make fun of people who have weight issues because you know it's like the last remaining stigma. Um, meanwhile, women who have weight issues on the other end of the spectrum, like what I had, are almost lionized in our society and kind of treated like they have such incredible willpower when really they're just, they can just be the same issue, um, issue, just different ends of the spectrum. So I wrote the book and the book paved the way towards writing for magazines and I started writing for women's magazines, uh, which I, is what I do now pretty much full time. I write for, I'm full time freelance. And it's great, I mean, I get to write about different topics every single day, but you know, I'm well aware that many magazines portray the very images that make some of us or all of us feel badly about our bodies and that have made me feel badly. And so people ask me how I rectify that in my mind and I guess I say I choose to write for magazines that I feel portray as positive and strong of an image as possible. I feel like fit pregnancy and, um, and O and self portray strong fit women. Uh, don't get me wrong, they're still airbrushed like crazy. My body image book cover photo was airbrushed. Um, they, they've made my hair look thicker, they put gloss on my lips, they smoothed down my collarbone, and that's a body image book. And you know, one of the things that I really want you to leave this talk, actually probably the most important thing, is just realizing that every image that you see in life is, has pretty much been altered in some way. And you know, we can hear it and we understand, yes, the Victoria's Secret models don't really look like that, but they really don't. And, and until you kind of see some before or afters, and I want to show you them, you don't really grasp the fact that everything that we see has just been either, you know, waists have been carved down, carved out, and cleavage has been added in, and pimples have been erased, and hair has been, you know, fluffed up. And so the images that we compare ourselves to, they don't even exist. I remember reading a quote by Cindy Crawford where she said, even I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford, because she doesn't. So let's look at a couple pictures. Um, if we can put the lights down, that'll help you look to see them. So let's see this one. Okay, so this is Faith Hill on the cover of Red Book, and it's gonna toggle back and forth between the before and after. So this is the before, and that's the after. So if you look at, like, first of all, look at this part of her, of her, um, her back and shoulder. You can see how it was kind of shaved down a little bit. Um, look at her arm. You can see how her arm was slimmed. You can see how her leg was slimmed as well. Um, it might be hard to see, but she had some wrinkles under and around her eyes that were taken away, some flyaway hairs that were taken away, her collarbone was, was softened, the little part that we call like the bra back fat area was taken away. And you can also see in her before picture, she only had one arm, but in her after picture, she has two. So an arm was just added, an arm that doesn't exist was just added in. <laughs> Um, let's see, this one, this is actually, so this is just a photographer who, um, who shows his work online, uh, his work with airbrushing. So here's a picture of Eva Longoria and I think her manager. This is the after picture. And when I scroll over it, you'll see the before. And you can see the difference between the before and after. So you see she has a full face of makeup was basically added in the after. Eyeshadow, mascara, eyeliner. The green of her earrings is intensified. The whites of her teeth are whiter. Um, even things like the lighting over her chest, you can see was added in to make her, her chest look bigger. You know, her skin just looks, and I mean, look, she's gorgeous in real life. There doesn't need to be any changes made, but this is the image that we see when we look, and it doesn't look totally distorted. That looks totally normal to us, but it's all fake. The guy got a makeover too, look. Look at his skin is all, you know, has been totally brightened and they didn't give him hair though. Um, 
here's another one. This is Nina Garcia from Project Runway, and here's her after, and here's her before. And honestly, if I had shown you, if I had shown you, I know we're like, oh God, Nina Garcia. If, you, if I had shown you her before picture, you'd think she looks great. But her after picture, she looks decades younger. Um, makeup has totally been added. Every, I mean, everything, even like, look at her little necklace and how bef this is what it looks like before and after there's that little glimmer, that shine that was added onto it just to make it look extra special. Um, oh, I never realized this. Look, she's not got no earrings on here, but here she has earrings. Um, and this is one other one. This is not a famous person. I just think this is funny because look at her. This is her after. This is her before. <laughs> <laughs> they just changed her up, but she didn't want to get dressed for work. So she just showed up in her sweats. Um, okay, this will look later. Sorry, one sec. Okay. This is just a funny card that I like. Okay. Um, so here's Madonna in a before and after, and you can see um, the, ar the muscles in her arms were softened, and if you look at the veins in her arms, they were also smoothed away. Um, her hair, you know, was smoothed down, her makeup, her just everything and, I, and I'm not showing you these images to you know to make fun of these celebrities I just want to show you that even they don't look like what they look like in the images that we see here's one Mariah Carey so the the original picture is on the left and then in Saudi Arabia where it's considered you know untoward to show so much skin they just covered her body with the same material like they drew the material on to make it look like she had a shirt on Okay, so this is H&M's website where a lot of us, you know, go to shop. So look and see if you see something similar between all the girls. They have the same body. And so basically H&M has actually admitted, this just happened this summer, that this body actually doesn't even exist. It's a computer generated body. And then they just put different, they like plop different models heads on the bodies and um, tint the skin. and. So if you ever get something in the mail from a clothing company and you think, why does it look like me like it does in the model? It's because the model is a cartoon and um, these people, these, this body doesn't even exist. Uh, and here's a picture of Jessica Alba and you can see how she was manipulated. This is a liquor ad. Um, her waist is smaller, her thighs are thinner, her boobs are bigger. Her um, skin is much tanner, uh, more olive. So even, even little things like the lines in her clothing have been smoothed out. Uh, Kim Kardashian, she tweeted this picture herself a few years ago to show, you know, that some, some change, just to show women out there, you know, look, I get retouched, I get altered. Um, you know, there's like a little, a little tiny lump on her leg that was, uh, smoothed away and just overall it looks like everything was just kind of shrunk just a tiny tiny bit it's so uh subtle but it all these images all this retouching kind of just builds and builds to make us think that women look one way and they don't and i think it's so important for men to see this kind of stuff also so they don't have these crazy unrealistic expectations of what women look like when when they see them because we don't. And you know, guys get airbrushed too. I remember Andy Roddick was on, a, uh, the tennis player was on the cover of a magazine a few years ago saying, uh, I wish I was built like that, but I do not have those pecs. You know, my muscles were totally enhanced for this picture. Another Kardashian, this was with her first baby. Um, so this story was all about how she had lost all of her baby weight and, you know, a week after having the baby. It turns out not only did she, po not only did she not agree to this interview, she didn't even speak to them, but she never posed for this picture for them. The picture was some sort of like another picture that she had released that was taken from the chest up and then they just drew on the rest of her body. And I'm happy that stars like her are coming out and saying, I don't look like that. That never happened because then we, we start to realize this is the Ralph Lauren ad I was talking about. So this model, um, you know, claimed that she was fired for being too fat. 
She's 5'11 and 115 pounds. And the image on the right, I mean, when I look at that, I think that looks like some, like a Tim Burton character. The fact that that actually appeared in mainstream publications, I mean, that had to make it through multiple levels of approval from you know copywriters and advertisers and magazine editors. It does not look normal. That was an actual Ralph Lauren ad. Her hips are smaller than her head. Um, this made a big splash. This is the cover of W Magazine. And if you look, it's, it's hard to see, but if you look at her, her left hip, so the hip on the right, and you see where her hip is above the swath of fabric and then when it com where it comes out by her hand, you can see there's a significant discrepancy. Um, so basically this is just the bad airbrushing job. So her hip actually probably comes out much more towards her, her wrist, but they, they wanted to show some air in there, so they cut it and then they forgot to shave it down on the bottom. Oh, I love this one. So this is a Victoria's Secret model named Carolina Kirkova. And something, I, I don't know what the condition is, but she doesn't have a belly button, as you can see in the picture on the, on the left. It's some sort of surgery, I think, when she was younger. She doesn't have a belly button. But every time we open up the catalog, we see the image on the right with the belly button. So basically, they just cut the belly button off of another model and drag it over and put it on her belly. And it's, it's tiny, it's just a little thing. It's just her belly button, but it just goes to show how really nothing that we see is real. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Not even belly buttons. Uh, okay, so then I've got some more things to show you. So this is more about celebrities. You know, we, we talk about how celebrities are making us feel badly, but there are actually some, some celebs out there who do a lot, I think, to help us feel good about our quote-unquote flaws. So I thought we could look through a few of them. So Keira Knightley and Natalie Portman are two celebrities who have not succumbed to getting implants, and they make us feel, you know, realize that it's okay to have A's, which is what I normally have when I don't have a baby, <laughs> and which is why I feel compelled to nurse her until she's a teenager. <laughs> um, Okay, and this is actually, so Keira Knightley, this was an, an image from when she was in a movie called King Arthur, and you can see on the right, that's what they did to her in the, in the American film, um, in the ads that they put out, that you could see they augmented her chest. The, the image on the left is actually what she looks like. Um, the next one is, oh, butts. So, I mean, these are two women that we've, you know, read a lot about. And uh, Venus, or Serena Williams, has a great quote where she talked about growing up, um, you know, her sister Venus has more of a, an, athl an athletic build. And she said, I'm super curvy. I have big boobs and this massive butt. She's tall and she's like a model and she fits everything. But she said that she feels like she, as an adult, has grown into her beauty and grown into her curves. Um, and now that she, she feels happy about being different because, quote, different is good. Um, Kirsten Dunst. So I did not call it a snaggle tooth. She did. Uh, her exact quote was, I love my snaggle things. They give me character and character is sexy. And so her and Jewel and Anna Paquin and Lauren Hutton, the famous supermodel, are all good examples of, you know, the fact that you don't have to have braces, perfect teeth to have a great confident smile. Um, scars. So Padma Lakshmi, who is on Top Chef, has a crazy scar going down her arm, and she always wears sleeveless tops. It's one of her trademarks. She almost always wears sleeveless tops. And so she's talked about how she used to always cover it up. She, had, she was in a bad car accident when she was a child in India, and she has talked about how she used to always cover them up, and then she was discovered as a model, and the man who discovered her was so into the scar, and he said, we have to show this on the runway, and he started dressing her in sleeveless tops, and a star was born. Um, and Tina Fey, it's, you don't often see it. I, I know that she takes photographs from the other side a lot, but uh, she has a really big scar on her face from a really bizarre childhood violent attack that she was in when she was really little. And, um, but when she's on the cover of magazines, they airbrush it out. But you can see it there. And these are two women who are you know, regarded as being attractive, and they've got pretty big scars. Um, buff arms. So Michelle Obama was the first 
uh, first lady to pose for her official White House picture in a sleeveless top showing her arms, which have been tubbed post Title IX arms. Cameron Diaz has some pretty serious guns too, so I feel like they help us, you know, feel like it's okay to have, you know, nice, strong, muscular arms. Um, Leah Michelle, she's got a good quote about her nose. Um, she told People Magazine, I grew up in this typical New Jersey town where everyone looked the same. If you didn't have a nose job, you were about to get one. Agents and casting directors told me to get one, but my mother said, Barbara Streisand never did, and neither are you. I mean, whoa. Um, <laughs> they, you know, these are two women who show that, you know, it can, you know, they can be big and you can still look fantastic. And <laughs> um, I can't even, I don't even, I have no, no more words to, about this. But um, <laughs> Sofia Vergara had a great quote and from Modern Family. She said, I'm a woman, but I'm super exaggerated with my boobs, my ass, my makeup, my accents. When I get ready for an event, I always look at myself in the mirror and I say, I look like a transvestite. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, I also love the fact that she's actually a natural blonde. You might have read that in magazines. She's talked about the fact that she dyes her hair black. So I think that's cool because so many of us feel like we have to dye our hair blonde. Um, present company excluded, I, I get highlights, you know, we feel like, you know, blonde is, you know, what you need to be, but she's a great example of how gorgeous dark hair can be. Like my friend Michelle Heyer. <laughs> um, okay, celebrities that make us proud to, you know, be plus size. I mean, Melissa McCarthy is an Emmy winner. Adele is a, you know, blockbuster singer, and both of them, neither of them are, you know, tiny little things. Um, and, you know, they're both beautiful and funny and wildly successful. Um, do I have any more? Let me see. Oh, yeah. I like this quote. So Lady Gaga, I think, is a great example because she's someone who's not conventionally considered, like, you know, drop-dead gorgeous. But she is, you know, extremely successful and a fashion icon. I love this quote. When I wake up in the morning, I feel just like any other insecure 24-year-old. Then I say, bitch, you're Lady Gaga. You get up and walk the walk today. <laughs> I know. We should all just put that on our mirrors and just take out her name and write our own name. <laughs> bitch, you're Leslie. You get up and walk the walk today. <laughs> I hope I can say bitch. <laughs> um, Kate Winslet, <clears throat> this was great because she came out. She was... Um, retouched on the cover of GQ and she came out and said I do not look like that and more importantly I don't want to look like that and so she I think she might have even sued the the magazine for doing that Kate Winslet is a big body image here she does stuff like this all the time she refuses to be airbrushed and let them get away with it so she always comes out and says hey I was touched up and I want I want everyone to see I've got um DeFi's motto on the bottom um, this is another one, Gabrielle Sidibe, who was in Precious. And so this was, this woman offered us a leading lady unlike anyone we'd ever seen. I mean, she had this gorgeous dark skin and she was plus size and she was the it person of the year. And her quote, if you can't read it says, she said this to Oprah. One day I had to sit down with myself and decide that I loved myself no matter what my body looked like and what other people thought about my body. I got tired of feeling bad all the time. I got tired of hating myself. Um, Ellen's generous, I think, is a great body image role model because she's this kind of out-of-the-box beauty, and she's you know in her 50s and a lesbian and has short hair, and she doesn't fit into the typical cover girl stereotype, and yet here she is. She's a cover girl. So she just, and she's just kind of radiates happiness and confidence. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, this came out in More Magazine a little while ago where she did a before and after picture. And um, let me read you her quote. Uh, she said, people assume that I'm walking around in little spaghetti strap dresses. It's insidious. Glam Jamie, the perfect Jamie, the great figure, blah, blah, blah. I don't want the unsuspecting women of the world to think I've got it going on. It's such a fraud, and I'm the one perpetuating it. 
And so um, later in the, in the story, they revealed that it took her 13 people to look like that in her, in her after picture. And um, actually, I don't know if you saw on the cover of my, uh, on my homepage, there's a picture of me posing with Beyonce, who is actually my best friend, if you don't know. Um, and so I met her back on a Today Show appearance. She wanted to be here, but she was busy. Um, <laughs> Uh, she, so when I met her on this, the, the topic of the segment was um, her mom had created this line for Walmart of clothing that fits women of all sizes from 2 through 20. And so I didn't even know she was going to be on. There were a bunch of models that came out in clothing, and the fifth model was Beyonce. And so at that point, I was basically like, I could have... I don't even know why they didn't just take me off the stage. It was like I didn't even exist anymore. And she was on. And when we were done, I took a picture with her and her mom. And I didn't realize that throughout the course of the segment that the room had filled up with her entourage. She had a stylist, a manicurist, a makeup artist, a hairstylist, a security person. Probably her trainer was in there. She had this huge team of people that was making her look the way that she looks. Um, I don't know if I, I usually have a picture of her on, a cover, on the cover of a magazine where you can see that her skin color has been tinted different shades depending on the magazine that she's in. Some make her darker, some make her lighter. Um, and one thing I will say about her, which is when I pose for the picture with her, so it was me on one side, her mom in the middle, and her on the other, and I got to touch her elbow from behind, and her skin was super soft. And there is no airbrushing that. So Beyonce has super soft skin. And that's actually <laughs> my claim to fame, is that I touched Beyonce's elbow. <laughs> And I'm sure she's somewhere talking about that exact interaction right now. <laughs> um, Pink is, I think, a great body image hero. She, you know, she's a little more androgynous. She's got a more muscular body type. She's got short hair. And she sings these great lyrics that make us realize you know, that it's okay to be who we are and, and, you know, don't put up with crap from people and, and, you know, be confident in who you are. Helen Mirren is, is fantastic just because she shows that, you know, it's not all downhill, you know, once you hit 50. I think she looks phenomenal, actually. And then if you remember this with Tyra Banks, um, you know, this picture was taken and she got all these horrible headlines were being written about her. It was awful. And she basically said what so many of us wish we could say, not just to other critics, but to the own critic in our head, which is this. I don't want to say yet another swear word in case I get in trouble. <laughs> I think that's all I've got for picks. So um, what I want to do is do a quick reading from my book and then we can maybe talk about you know, if anyone has any questions, or you can come up to me afterwards. Um, so this part of the chapter of the book is the chapter on, on breasts. Maybe you've heard me talk about them already. Right. Um, and so this, this sub-chapter is called Sizing Up the Competition or Seeing My Maid of Honors slash Husband's Ex-Girlfriend's Boobs for the First Time. Uh, my husband, Dan, was my best and closest friend for nearly a decade before we got married. And throughout that time, he made it fairly clear he wanted to take our relationship to the next level. Dan is smart, funny, handsome, loyal, everything a girl could want. So I did what any woman in her right mind would do. I ran. Therefore, it was only a matter of time before he was snatched up by an equally amazing woman, Trish. In fact, I introduced them. That's because Trish was fast becoming one of my closest friends, and we had been spending a lot of time together. Besides, I was happily dating someone else, and it delighted me that these two had found each other. Did I mention yet that Trish has 36 double Ds? I say that not because her breasts had anything to do with her getting together with Dan, but because the first time I saw them in their full glory, when I took her to my gym on a day pass, I nearly passed out. My God, were they big. And full, and tan, with no tan lines. Sure, they weren't as perky as mine, but who needs perk when you can strap on a bra and have natural cleavage that tickles your chin? <laughs> I must admit, when Trish pulled her harness of a sports bra over her head that day in the locker room, my eyes were drawn to her nipples as if by some magnetic force. It was like a blip, blip, <laughs> blip. If boobs were people, mine were Katie Couric and hers were Marilyn Monroe. Six months later, Trish and Dan had broken up. My relationship had ended, and I realized I was ready to start something with Dan. Now, in the past, I've had major jealousy issues when it came to boyfriends, ex-girlfriends. 
the kind of issues that lead to hyperventilation, crying jags, and one very special knockdown drag out fight in a Dairy Queen parking lot. But with Trish and Dan, it was different. I was never jealous. I never pictured them in bed together or anything of that sort. If I did, how could I have asked her to be the maid of honor at our wedding? There were definitely times when I found myself thinking back to that unveiling in the locker room and wondering whether my breasts measured up to the pair he had most recently seen and touched. I never voiced these concerns to either of them, but they existed. Was I too small? Could he settle for wine glasses instead of goblets? In retrospect, I realized how ridiculous these thoughts were. <clears throat> Dan treats me like an absolute queen. Should something horrible happen to my breasts, he would kiss the scars as if they were made of gold. And besides, although Trish and I are both nearly six feet tall and admittedly asked whether we're sisters when we go out together, our bodies are built too differently to be compared. She's curvy and voluptuous, I'm more athletically shaped. Soon Dan and I, after 10 years of friendship, were engaged to be married and registering at Crate and Barrel for wine glasses. But what about the locker room experience for women who feel awkward with too much junk in the front? For example, unbeknownst to me, Trish, my fabulously filled out friend, was not only teased as an early developing child, but is now asked, sometimes by complete strangers, whether her breasts are fake. Trish admitted she doesn't remember the first time she and I stripped down together, but she's sure she was thinking something to the effect of, oh my gosh, I hope she doesn't think I'm gross and have the biggest boobs ever. When in the locker room, she said she almost always attempts to push her chest as far into the locker as possible while taking off her two sports bras. That Trish feels the need to hide what so many others would envy makes me sad, but for her, they're a hassle and a nuisance. I asked her whether she could recall seeing my chest for the first time that day in the locker room, and she thought about it for a second and said, although she wasn't sure it was the first time she'd ever seen them, she remembered being surprised that they didn't touch my torso. They were completely suspended in midair, she described, <laughs> as if such a feat were worthy of a Nobel Prize in physics. Oh, engineering. Um, <laughs> Uh, she said, I would need some sort of pulley system to achieve that. But that's one of the great things about Trish. She's not afraid to laugh at herself. Sometimes when it comes to body image issues, mild self-deprecation can help take away the sting of perceived flaws. But naked, Trish is gorgeous. And to quote Terry Hatcher in Seinfeld, I always tell her, they're real and they're spectacular. And you all are real, and you all are spectacular, and I want you to remember that. And, um, and you can come up and ask me anything. I clearly don't hide anything. Um, and you know, if you don't want to ask something, we can, we can open it up this discussion now. And um, that's the end of my talk, so thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone want to ask something now? Or are we shy? <laughs> Okay, then afterwards, just feel free to come up and say whatever you want, okay? Thanks.